Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam from Historic Travels and welcome to another video. And as always, before we get started today, I'd just like to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subs and to thank everybody who's been leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you all so much, I really appreciate it. And if you would like to take a couple of extra steps to help support the channel a little bit more, there's a merch store and a Patreon for this channel in the links below. Thank you all so much for all your support. All right guys, well hey, the time has finally come to release the video that all of you have been waiting on for quite some time. In today's video, we're going to be telling the complete story of the Titanic sister ship, the HMHS Britannic. The video you are about to watch is a documentary video made combining every single episode of my Britannic Timeline series merged together into one massive documentary film. So as you're watching this video, if you notice a point in time where I change clothes in between shots, well, then you'll know you transition from one episode to another episode. So just keep that in mind. All right, guys. Well, hey, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy the story of the Titanic sister ship, the HMHS Britannic. And all right, without any further ado, let's begin the life story of this incredible ship. The HMHS Britannic was the third and final ship built of the Olympic class of ocean liners. It was the White Star Line's intention that this ship, along with her two sisters, Olympic and Titanic, would be the biggest and most luxurious vessels on the Atlantic. It was also their intention that the Britannic would be the biggest and best ship of the Olympic class, with the construction of the Britannic improving on the designs of the Olympic and the Titanic before her. Now, if you have a sharp eye, you may have noticed that on that poster you just saw of the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic, that the Britannic's name actually said gigantic on that poster. So why is this? Well, it is theorized that the Britannic was originally going to be called gigantic, but the White Star Line had this ship's name changed later on. Now, why would they do this? Well, according to the rumor, it is because of the loss of the RMS Titanic. It is theorized that because the Titanic was the biggest and most luxurious ship in the world at the time, with its sinking, the White Star Line was afraid that the name Gigantic wouldn't resonate well with people, so they decided to change it. And this does make sense to me. Now, officially, the White Star Line has denied the claims that the Britannic was ever going to be called Gigantic, although there are some documents out there that seem to lean in the direction that the White Star Line was planning to have this ship named Gigantic. Although officially, we will, ne we will never know the answer for certain. Construction of the Britannic began on the 30th of November in the year 1911. Fun fact, the Britannic was actually constructed and built in the exact same slipway as the Olympic was. The Olympic was launched from this slipway almost a year before construction on the Britannic began. So, that means that during the early stages of the Britannic's construction, the Britannic and its sister ship Titanic were actually together in the shipyard at Harland & Wolf, although construction on the Britannic wouldn't get that far along before the Titanic eventually left the shipyard. However, construction on the Britannic would be ultimately delayed because on April 15, 1912, her sister ship, RMS Titanic, struck an iceberg and sank in the middle of the North Atlantic. So, because the Titanic went down the way it did, the designers at the Harland & Wolf shipyard took another look at Britannic, and then they wanted to make sure that if Britannic suffered the same amount of damage as Titanic, that the Britannic would be able to survive. Since the construction of the Britannic wasn't that far along at the time of the Titanic disaster, the shipbuilders at Harland & Wolf really didn't have that difficult of a time going back and looking at the plans of the Britannic and changing them a bit so that if the Britannic was involved in a Titanic-like scenario, the Britannic would not sink. Here are some of the design changes that they made to the Britannic following the Titanic disaster. Number one, they added a double hull to certain areas of the Britannic. Now, the entire ship didn't have a double hull. The only areas that did were basically the mid-sections of the ship, more specifically the areas that protected the boiler room and engine room from the ocean outside. This area was equipped with a double hull. And the purpose of a double hull is that if the first layer of the hull is breached, the second layer of the double hull would protect the interior sections of the Britannic from the ocean outside. So... The second thing that they had to do to the ship in order to accommodate this double hull was increase the width of the ship to 94 feet. Uh, the third change that they made to the Britannic was that of the ship's 15 watertight compartments, they increased the height of six of them up to B deck instead of D deck where they normally were. Now, because of these changes, the Britannic could now survive her first six watertight compartments breached and this ship would not sink. 
This is the exact same amount of damage that the Titanic had on the night that she struck the iceberg. Now, it also seems like the sinking of the Titanic may have led to one more design change to the Britannic. During the inquiries into the Titanic disaster, even though a lot of people said that the Titanic broke in two during the final moments of her sinking, officially, the inquiry stated that the Titanic did not break in two, but in fact the ship sank in one piece. However, it does seem like the designers at Harland and Wolf may have been suspicious about this. So, they implemented yet one last final major change to the design of the Britannic. You see, on ships like the Titanic, there are these things called expansion joints. And the purpose of an expansion joint is to allow the superstructure of a vessel to flex while a vessel's at sea and traveling across the Atlantic, so it doesn't put so much strain on the hull of the ship. Now, in case you're wondering what part of the Titanic classifies as superstructure, it's basically the top sections of the ship right here, the areas that are painted white, that technically classifies as superstructure. Now, in the case of Titanic, this ship had two expansion joints. There was one located between the first and second funnel, and another one located between the third and fourth funnel. Now, when it comes to Britannic, its expansion joint layout is completely different. The Britannic had four expansion joints, one located between the first and second funnel, another one located between the second and third funnel, another one between the third and fourth funnel, and they had another one back here on the back section of the ship. So, why would they make this drastic design change to the Britannic with its expansion joints? Well, officially, they never said anything about it at Harlan and Wolf. But unofficially, it seems like that people think that the shipbuilders at Harlan and Wolf may have been suspicious about the claims of the Titanic breaking in half. Even though they never officially stated this, if the reports about the Titanic breaking in half were true, then the shipbuilders at Harlan and Wolf may have been worried about the structural integrity of their ships. So they may have added these extra expansion joints as their way of just making sure that if the reports of the Titanic breaking in half were true, that it didn't happen to the Britannic. So, as I said, officially we can't prove this, but unofficially, this claim does make a lot of sense to me. Now, once the design changes to the Britannic's hull were figured out, construction on this ship resumed immediately. And as far as the actual construction of the Britannic's hull was concerned, the construction went very smoothly and very efficiently. And then, on February 26, 1914, the Britannic slid down the slipway and entered the water for the first time. There was a huge celebration to celebrate the launch of the Britannic. Tons of people showed up in order to watch the brand new White Star Line ship enter the water for the first time. The White Star Line even hosted a dinner party afterwards to celebrate the launch. So, the launch of the Britannic marked the beginning of what the White Star Line hoped would be the life of their biggest and best ship built to date. Once the Britannic entered the water, the fitting out process of this vessel began. And for those of you who don't know, the fitting out process of a vessel is basically the time where a ship gets her engines installed, her boilers, her funnels, all the stuff the ship needs to become a passenger liner is installed during her fitting out process. This also includes her furnishings and everything that a ship needs to keep her passengers comfortable. And in the case of Britannic, this was also the time period where the ship received her last and probably her most most critical brand new safety feature. Now this brand new safety feature that they added to the Britannic was something called a gantry davit. Now for those of you who don't know, a davit is basically those cranes that they have on a boat deck of a ship like the Titanic and the purpose of these is to lower a ship's lifeboat over the side. The Titanic had them, the Olympic had them, all ships had these. But what made the Britannic's davits so special is that the gantry davits were electric. All the davits on Olympic and Titanic had to be operated manually, meaning that there had to be a man right there and they had to be turning a crank or using a rope to lower a lifeboat over the side. But with the Britannic, the gantry davits were completely electric. Think of them like giant electric cranes. That's the best way I can describe them. This is a picture of the gantry davits as seen on Britannic. And one other thing about these davits that makes them so much better than the old school davits besides them being electric is now they're much larger than an old school davit, meaning that now you could store lifeboats on the center of a ship's boat deck and literally just stack lifeboats one on top of the other. And if you need to get at them, all you have to do is turn on this davit's electric crane, have the davit come back towards the center of the ship, pick a lifeboat up, haul it over the ship's side, and lower it away, and then just keep repeating the process. 
Think about how much more efficient this is in lowering light boats away than it was doing it the old-fashioned way like we saw on Titanic with the manual davits. And because now you could actually store light boats on a center of a ship and just stack them on top of each other, think about how many more light boats you can now add to a ship's boat deck because of these davits. So as you can plainly see, these electric gantry davits were a huge improvement over the old school davits that you see on the Titanic. Now the gantry davits weren't installed on Britannic just to replace the old school manual lifeboat davits. The Britannic would have these as well. But the gantry davits were there to more or less increase the number of lifeboats that could be held on the Britannic. And they wanted to have these on here so that if the need should arise, the gantry davits and the old school manual lipo davits could work together with each other to ensure that the people on Britannic would have more than enough means to get off the Britannic should an emergency come up. So honestly, with all the design changes made to the Britannic following the Titanic disaster, and with the addition of these brand new gantry davits, the Britannic is looking like it's going to be one of the safest ships on the Atlantic. And I'm sure there were a lot of people out there who were looking forward to sailing on her once construction was complete. However, these people wouldn't get a chance. Because in August of 1914, as construction on the Britannic was still underway, something would happen in the world that would change the fate of the Britannic forever. In August of 1914, World War I officially begun and quickly spread across Europe. And because the need for resources by the British Admiralty was so great, they decided to slow any other construction projects that were going on at the time that were not directly involved with the military. So because of this, construction on the Britannic was delayed, but ultimately it wasn't cancelled. So work would continue on the Britannic, although it would take a little bit longer before the vessel was ready to enter transatlantic service. During the initial outbreak of the First World War, the British Admiralty went out and requisitioned a good number of civilian ships and then converted them over for military service because they needed as many ships as possible for the war effort. Although larger ocean liners, like the soon-to-be-completed Britannic, at least at first, weren't considered for military use because these vessels were so big and more difficult to operate and they cost more money to operate as well. This was something that the British Admiralty had discovered years earlier with the construction of the Mauritania and its sister ship, the Lusitania, because part of Cunard's contract with the British government for helping them fund the construction of these ships was that the British government wanted these vessels to be able to be used as armed merchant cruisers should the need arise. Basically, they wanted the Lusitania and the Mauritania to be able to protect ships or convoys as they crossed the Atlantic. Believe it or not, the Lusitania and the Mauritania even had spots on their decks where they could install guns should the need arise. Although, when they were testing the Lusitania and the Mauritania, they discovered that these ships, the fuel costs required to run them, basically, it wasn't practical to use these ships as armed merchant cruisers. This is one reason why the Lusitania continued its passenger liner services even after World War I had begun. So for the next several months, while World War I raged on, the Britannic sat quietly in the shipyard at Harland and Wolfe, where the remaining staff still working in the shipyard tried to finish the Britannic. But work was proceeding very slowly due to the limited amount of resources the shipyard had, and it was also limited to the number of people that were there working on the Britannic. But as I said earlier, there wasn't any urgent need to finish the ship at this time. And in November of 1914, the Britannic sister ship, the RMS Olympic, arrived at the shipyard of Harland and Wolf, where the White Star Line hoped the Olympic would be able to remain until after the war was over. There was even a picture taken of both the Olympic and the Britannic sitting side by side of each other in the same shipyard. For the next six months, the Britannic sat quietly in the shipyard of Harland and Wolf while construction on this vessel continued. Construction never stopped on the Britannic. And then in May of 1915, the British Admiralty decided that they needed to get bigger and bigger ships into the war effort. You see, the naval war of World War I had extended into the Eastern Mediterranean. So the British Admiralty decided that they needed increasingly and increasingly bigger ships to help out with the war effort. Mostly they needed these ships to be troop ships and hospital ships. So right around this time period, the Britannic was actually undergoing her own mooring trials of the ship's engines, which basically means is they have the Britannic tied up somewhere so the ship can't move, and then they spin the Britannic's propellers and test her engines just to see how things are going to go. 
The shipyard of Holland and Wolfe was contacted by the British Admiralty, and they were told that they didn't have a date yet, but they knew that they were most likely going to need the Britannic to enter emergency services, and they wanted to have the ship ready to go. And they told them that when we need the Britannic, you have less than four weeks to get the ship to us. So finish construction on the Britannic as quickly as possible, and we'll let you know when we need the ship to enter service. However, in the exact same month that the shipyard of Holland and Wolfe was told to get the Britannic ready to enter emergency services, one of the worst naval disasters of the First World War occurred. The RMS Lusitania, heading for Liverpool from New York City, was torpedoed by German U-boat U-20 off the coast of Ireland. The ship sank in 18 minutes, taking the lives of 1,197 people who were on board the ship. After the Germans sunk the Lusitania, the public outcry against the Germans for sinking this ship was immense. The public could not believe that the Germans would target a passenger liner. And while not the only cause, the sinking of the Lusitania was a factor in the U.S. getting involved in the First World War. But after the Lusitania went down, it seems like the British Admiralty really stepped up their game in fighting the Germans. They were determined, after the loss of the Lusitania, to do whatever it took to defeat the Germans, and the public was on their side. Everybody wanted to defeat the Germans and end the war as quickly as possible. In June of 1915, the British Admiralty decided to use the first two major transatlantic ocean liners and finally put them into service serving the military. The two ships were the RMS Mauritania and its sister ship the RMS Aquitania. The British Admiralty wanted to use these vessels as troop ships, and these ships continued to do this job for the next several months. Although in August of 1915, as casualties continued to mount, the British Admiralty decided that they needed the Aquitania to become a hospital ship. So, with the Aquitania being now used for hospital ship functions, they needed another vessel to be a troop ship. So at this time, they pulled in the RMS Olympic into service and made this vessel the new troop ship. Now that the British Admiralty had the Mauritania, the Aquitania, and the Olympic all in service helping out with the war effort, they were anxious to get the Britannic into service as quickly as possible. And then, in November of 1915, construction on the Britannic was finally completed, and the British government wasted no time in pulling this ship into military service. It was decided that the Britannic would be a hospital ship, and this is the role that the Britannic would play in helping out with the war effort. Once it was decided that the Britannic would serve her country as a hospital ship, the vessel was painted very differently than what most ships looked like at the time. The hull of the Britannic was painted completely white. There was a large green stripe painted on the Britannic's hull that ran the entire length of the ship, and there were also a series of red crosses painted on the Britannic's hull as well. This was because the British government wanted anybody who saw the Britannic to know that this vessel was a hospital ship and that it shouldn't be attacked under any circumstances. You see, due to the Geneva Convention, it stated that if a vessel was being used as a hospital ship, then even if this vessel was spotted by enemy forces, they were not to attack the Britannic. So that means that if a German U-boat captain saw the Britannic sailing along due to the Geneva Convention and the fact that this vessel was a hospital ship, as long as it wasn't being used for anything military-based, that captain of that U-boat was not to attack the Britannic. Now once they were done turning the Britannic into a hospital ship, this vessel was without a doubt a floating hospital, and it was equipped with all the equipment that a hospital would need to treat wounded soldiers that were hurt during the war. Some of the equipment that was on board the Britannic are of the following. The Britannic was equipped with 3,309 beds for the wounded soldiers. There were several operating rooms installed on the Britannic. These operating rooms were mostly in the reception room and in the first class dining room. Remember, these were some of the biggest rooms on the ship, so these were pretty massive operating rooms to say the least. The cabins on B deck were used to house the ship's doctors. And the lower bridge area was also used to accommodate the lightly wounded soldiers. So soldiers who were hurt, but not critically hurt. So as you can see, the Britannic was well equipped to help a good number of soldiers. And there is no doubt that this ship would be greatly needed as World War I continued to rage on. Once the conversion process on the Britannic was complete and this vessel was ready to begin service as a hospital ship, the vessel was given her new official name. Throughout the rest of the war, the Britannic would be known as HMHS Britannic, which stands for His Majesty Hospital Ship Britannic. Everybody who sailed on the Britannic hoped that this vessel would perform well and do her duty as a hospital ship proudly. 
and everybody who was on the ship also hoped that after the war was over, the Britannic would be able to do what she was built to do, and become a passenger liner, and be able to take passengers across the Atlantic between Europe and the United States. On December 12, 1915, the HMHS Britannic was officially declared fit for duty and ready to begin her career as a hospital ship. At this time, all the personnel needed to run the Britannic began making their way to the vessel. Once all the personnel were on board, the Britannic would have a grand total of 101 nurses on board. There would be 336 non-commissioned officers on board, as well as 52 commissioned officers. There would also be a crew of 675 personnel on board the ship. It would take all of these people in order to help run the Britannic and allow her to serve her country as a hospital ship. The captain of the Britannic was a man by the name of Charles Bartlett, a longtime veteran of the White Star Line. He first joined the company in 1894. He was a well-liked and well-respected captain. His crew even had a nickname for him. They liked to call him Iceberg Charlie because he had a strange ability to detect, or predict I should say, the location of icebergs even before they were visible on whatever ship he was sailing on. Now even though the Britannic was officially declared fit for duty on December 12, 1915, it would still take around two weeks before the vessel was officially ready to head out to sea. They needed that time to get all of the supplies on board the Britannic, and they also needed that time to load up all of the ship's personnel. The Britannic left Liverpool on her maiden voyage on December 23, 1915, bound for the town of Mudrose on the island of Lemnos in the Aegean Sea. Her purpose for going to that town was to bring home wounded soldiers who were hurt fighting in the First World War. Now something pretty cool happened to the Britannic while this vessel was sailing on its maiden voyage. The route of the Britannic happened to line up with three other really famous ships. So for a while, all of these ships ended up sailing together with each other. These ships included the Britannic's very own sister ship, the RMS Olympic, and it also included the RMS Mauritania, as well as its sister ship, the RMS Aquitania. So all four of these ships ended up sailing with each other for a period of time. Can you just imagine how cool that must have been to anybody who was sailing on these ships to see all of these famous vessels sailing side by side with each other? And to be honest with you, I believe that if the RMS Titanic and the RMS Lusitania hadn't have sunk, that these ships would also have been sailing with all these other vessels. Now before the Britannic could make it successfully to Mudrose, the ship had to make a quick stop in the city of Naples, located in the country of Italy, in order to restock on coal. Fun fact about the city of Naples, do you see that giant mountain in the background of this picture? Well that mountain is actually a volcano. This volcano is known as Mount Vesuvius, and it's the exact same volcano that erupted in the year AD 79, completely burying and destroying the city of Pompeii. Now even though the Britannic and Pompeii have absolutely nothing to do with each other, I still think it's kind of eerie that the Britannic happened to visit the area at which Pompeii was at, given we know the ultimate fate of the Britannic. But anyway, after the Britannic got restocked on coal, the ship continued on to Mudrose, where it picked up all the wounded soldiers that they had, and then the vessel proceeded back to the UK to get all of these soldiers home, where they could try to recover from their injuries. Now once the Britannic successfully made it back to the UK and dropped off the wounded soldiers, the vessel would remain in the UK for the next few weeks, serving as just a floating hospital. The Britannic was parked off the coast of the island of Wight, and this is where the vessel would remain for a while, performing her duty as just a hospital. But then, as the First World War continued to rage on and casualties continued to mount, the Britannic's services were needed to help out with an evacuation at the location of Dar Daniels, and I apologize if I didn't say that right. So, on March 20th, 1916, the Britannic fired up her engines and once again proceeded into the war zone. Now, once the Britannic was successful in evacuating those soldiers and getting them back to the UK, something pretty unexpected happened to the Britannic. The British Admiralty told the White Star Line that once the Britannic returned home, they would no longer need the ship to serve as a hospital vessel, and it was okay if the White Star Line wanted to begin the process of converting the ship back into a passenger liner. The White Star Line was thrilled, and they said, yes, absolutely. So at this time, the British Admiralty paid the White Star Line £75,000 in order to help assist them with the price of converting the ship back into a passenger liner. Once this was done, the Britannic proceeded to the shipyard of Holland and Wolfe in Belfast, Ireland, where the conversion process began, and it would continue on un uninterrupted for the next few months. But it wasn't meant to be. 
After a few months of this, the British Admiralty contacted the White Star Line and told them they would need the Britannic once again to serve as a hospital ship, and they brought the ship back into service, serving the military once again. Man, that's such a bummer. Just think about this for a second. If the British Admiralty hadn't have recalled the Britannic, then it's quite possible that the Britannic would have never sunk and she would have been able to fulfill her original purpose of being a passenger liner. But unfortunately, that wasn't meant to be because the British Admiralty needed the ship once again. So unfortunately, she was converted back into a hospital ship and then once again proceeded back into the war zone. The Britannic officially returned to duty on the 26th of August, 1916, and then she sailed back to the Mediterranean Sea to be able to assist with the war effort. And honestly, for the next few months, life was pretty routine on board the Britannic. No real major incidents did happen to the ship during this time period. There was one evening where the Britannic did encounter a pretty severe storm, but the ship got through it without any major incidents occurring. Life on board the Britannic followed a pretty strict routine while she was serving as a hospital ship. You have to remember, she's a hospital ship, not a luxury ocean liner. Basically what happened each and every day was at 6 o'clock in the morning the patients were woken up and their premises were cleaned. Breakfast was served on board the Britannic at 6.30 a.m. and then the captain toured the entire ship doing an inspection of the vessel. Lunch was served at 12.30 p.m. and tea was served at 4.30 p.m. Patients were treated between meals, and those who wished to go up on the boat deck to have a walk were welcome to do so. At 8.30 p.m., all the patients went to bed, and then the captain did another tour or inspection of the entire vessel. Now, by the time November of 1916 had rolled around, the HMHS Britannic had successfully completed five voyages in and out of the Mediterranean Sea, successfully evacuating wounded soldiers and returning them home to the UK. However, on November 12, 1916, the Britannic services were needed once again and she was ordered to proceed to the island of Lemnos where she would pick up more wounded soldiers and return them home to the UK. The Britannic left Southampton and the first part of the voyage went without incident. The Britannic arrived once again in the city of Naples on November 17, 1916 for her usual refueling stop. However, while the Britannic was in port, a severe storm moved in which kept the Britannic from leaving the port for several days. And then, in the afternoon on November 19, 1916, a break in the weather finally occurred, which allowed the Britannic to successfully leave the city of Naples and proceed on towards the island of Lemnos. However, what everybody on board the Britannic didn't realize is that ultimately, the Britannic would never reach the island of Lemnos. When we last left the HMHS Britannic, the vessel was underway bound for the island of Lemnos, where the ship would arrive at the island, pick up more wounded soldiers, and then return them home to the UK. Now, as the vessel was completing this voyage, it had to make a quick stop at the city of Naples in order to restock on coal and other provisions. Although, while the vessel was at the city of Naples, a severe storm moved in, which prevented the Britannic from leaving the port for several days. And then in the afternoon of November the 19th, 1916, a break in the weather finally occurred and Captain Bartlett was able to get the Britannic out of Naples and back out to sea, heading for her original destination. Everything proceeds smoothly on board the Britannic for the next day and a half. That is, until the morning of November 21st, 1916, when the fate of the Britannic would be changed forever. Now, the island of Lemnos can be quite challenging for a ship to reach. This island is located in the Angean Sea, so the route in order to reach this island can be quite challenging to any vessel trying to reach it. Basically what happened was, the Britannic departed the city of Naples and then traveled south until the ship hit the Mediterranean Sea. Once it hit the Mediterranean, the Britannic began heading east, sailing towards the island of Lemnos. Once the ship was south of the country of Greece, the ship diverted north and headed into the Angean Sea. Now once in the Angean Sea, the Britannic passed a series of islands, and then once it got past all these islands, the ship could continue to head north until it reached the island of Lemnos. While the Britannic was sailing through the Angean Sea, the Britannic would sail in between two small islands. You got the island of Kia on the right, and another island called Macroninos Island on the left. The Britannic was due to sail in between these two islands at roughly 8 a.m. on November 21st, 1916. And it's when the Britannic was sailing in between these two islands that something horrible happened to the Britannic. Now, another name for the water located in between these two islands is also known as the Kia Channel. 
And what the captain of the Britannic didn't realize is that about a month before the Britannic was due to sail into the Kia Channel, a German U-boat, more specifically U-boat U-73, sailed into the Kia Channel and laid 12 mines. Now these mines weren't there to try to sink the Britannic, their main target was a warship of some kind. But the thing about mines is they don't pick and choose their targets, they destroy whatever hits them. And around a month later, on November 21st, 1916, the Britannic sailed into the Kia Channel, unknowingly steaming straight towards one of these mines. And then, at 8.12 a.m. on the morning of November 21st, 1916, the Britannic sailed straight towards one of the mines laid by this U-boat, made contact with the mine, and the mine detonated. Now, the blast from the mine lifted the Britannic's hull out of the water a bit, and also flexed the hull and warped it slightly. Now, this warping and flexing of the Britannic's hull caused the cable strung between the Britannic's masts to snap. So basically what this meant was, this cable was how the Britannic picked up transmissions from other ships. So now, with the cable broken, the Britannic could still transmit messages. However, the ship could not receive any messages from any other vessels. Now the reaction of the crew on board the Britannic following the mine detonation all had to do with where these crew were at the time that the ship hit the mine. If you were in the front part of the ship, the area that was closest to the mine detonation, well, you felt the explosion pretty clearly and you knew something serious had just happened. But if you were in the aft end section of the ship, the area furthest away from where the Britannic hit the mine, well, the explosion wasn't that strongly felt there. So honestly, some people on board the Britannic probably didn't even know that the ship had hit a mine. There was some testimony out there that some of the crew in the aft end section of the ship thought the Britannic had hit another vessel. They had no idea it was a mine detonation. Now, when the Britannic hit the mine, the nursing staff who were in the ship's first class dining room reacted immediately and headed to their stations in order to safeguard the lives of themselves and everybody who was on board their ship. Now, the captain of the Britannic, Captain Bartlett, he was on the bridge at the time of the mine detonation. So right after the ship hit the mine, he ordered the watertight doors closed and he began taking steps to try to see the condition of his vessel and determine if the Britannic was in any real danger. But what he didn't know at the time was that the damage to Britannic was worse than he could have possibly imagined. Now the Britannic struck the mine right around this area right here, in between the ship's third and fourth watertight compartment. And the force of the explosion put a massive hole in the Britannic's hull, allowing these two compartments to begin to rapidly flood with water. However, the force of the explosion also damaged the watertight bulkheads in between the third, second, and first compartment, allowing these compartments to also begin rapidly flooding with water. So basically within the first few minutes of the ship hitting the mine, the first four compartments of the Britannic were lost. Now the force of the explosion also damaged another part of the ship, more specifically the fireman's tunnel. And this was an area of the ship that allowed the firemen to access boiler room number six. So because this area was damaged, water could now begin to flood boiler room number six, which was the Britannic's fifth watertight compartment. Now there was one more critical problem that happened to the Britannic because of the mine detonation. Where the Britannic's hull got warped a bit from the force of the explosion, this actually damaged or warped the track that the watertight door used in between boiler room six and five. So because of this, this particular watertight door could not shut correctly, which allowed the water to flood boiler room number six and then continue on back into boiler room number five, which was the sixth watertight compartment on the Britannic to flood. So at this point, the Britannic has reached its flooding limit. If the Britannic remains motionless at this point, the Britannic can stay afloat with the first six watertight compartments flooded. If any more water gets inside the Britannic, then there is no way to save the ship. The Britannic would sink. Now, Captain Bartlett did more than just ordering the watertight doors shut on Britannic in the few minutes following the ship's encounter with the mine. His next order was to have all of the lifeboats on the Britannic readied for launch. However, he told the crew not to launch them yet. He also ordered to have the ship's Marconi wireless operator begin transmitting a distress call. The Marconi operator did this, and other ships did pick up the distress call. However, unknown to this Marconi operator and the captain of the Britannic, as stated earlier, the antenna cable that was strung between the Britannic's masts snapped due to the hull of the Britannic flexing from the explosion. So even though other ships were picking up the Britannic's distress call, and they were beginning to head towards the Britannic, Everybody on board the Britannic itself had no idea if help was coming. 
Now, the first 10 to 15 minutes on board the Britannic following the mine detonation were definitely the most critical for Captain Bartlett and his crew because it was during this time period that they would have been working to try to figure out if the Britannic could remain afloat or not. Now, during this time period, he would have been in constant communication with his crew that were doing inspections all over the ship to try to determine if the Britannic could remain afloat. Now, within the first five to 10 minutes, he would have also become aware that the first six compartments on the Britannic were lost and there was nothing that could be done for those. And even with this amount of damage, Captain Bartlett would be aware that the Britannic might be able to remain afloat, although he knew it would be a very close call. But he was also concerned about the Britannic's rate of sinking because with six watertight compartments breached, the Britannic wouldn't sink, but the bow of the Britannic would still begin to dip low into the water. In fact, the bow of the Britannic would dip so low in the water that after roughly 10 minutes of flooding, the Britannic's bow was in the general area that the Titanic's bow was one hour after the ship hit the iceberg. So as you can see, the Britannic is sinking very fast. However, what Captain Bartlett didn't know is that roughly 15 minutes after the Britannic hit the mine, one final event would occur that would ultimately doom the Britannic. What Captain Bartlett didn't realize is that at some point before the Britannic hit the mine, some of the hospital staff on board the Britannic had went to the bow section of the ship and opened up a good number of the Britannic's porthole windows to allow fresh air to begin to circulate into the interior sections of the Britannic. Now, once the Britannic hit the mine and the ship began to sink, the flooding was contained to the ship's first six watertight compartments, so the vessel would not sink with this amount of damage. Although, as the water level in these compartments continued to increase and the bow of the Britannic was pulled down deeper into the water, eventually, the E-deck porthole windows began to dip beneath the surface around 15 minutes after the ship hit the mine. If these windows were shut, it wouldn't have been a big deal. However, because these windows were opened, it allowed the water a new means to enter the ship, and it allowed the water to flood even deeper into the vessel. Not long after the E-deck porthole windows went underwater, flooding was reported in the Britannic's seventh watertight compartment. So at this point, the Britannic had passed its flooding limit and would eventually sink. All right, everybody. Well, hey, the time has finally come to conclude the story of the Titanic sister ship, the HMHS Britannic. Now, in the last episode, we talked about how the Britannic would eventually strike a mine. We also discussed how the Britannic would initially start flooding. We discussed the damage to the first six watertight compartments, and we also discussed the open porthole windows on E-Deck. Now, the first, or I'm sorry, the E-Deck porthole windows went underwater roughly 15 minutes after the Britannic struck the mine. However, at the beginning of this video, we're going to go back a bit to roughly 10 minutes after the Britannic struck the mine because there's some pretty important things that happened in that narrow window of time of five minutes that we need to discuss in order for you all to get a complete picture into the story of the Britannic. All right, everybody. Well, hey, without any further ado, let's begin today's video. It has been 10 minutes since the HMHS Britannic struck a mine off the coast of the island of Kia and slowly began to sink. At this time, Captain Bartlett would have had serious concerns about the safety of his vessel. Now remember, at this point in time, the E-deck porthole windows had not yet gone underwater, so Captain Bartlett wouldn't be aware if the vessel would be able to remain afloat or not. But still, he wasn't taking any chances, and he ordered his crew to get all the Britannic's personnel up on deck, and he also ordered the crew to get the Britannic's lifeboats readied for launch. However, he told the crew not to launch the lifeboats yet, because he had one last idea in mind where, even if the Britannic was declared sinking, if he could pull his idea off, he may, just may, be able to save the Britannic. Captain Bartlett's plan in order to attempt to save the Britannic involved the island of Kia, which at the time of the mine detonation was located just a few miles from the ship off the ship's starboard side. So what he wanted to do was, he wanted to turn the Britannic's engines back on and have the ship proceed ahead forward. Then he was going to order the helmsman to turn the Britannic to starboard and have the ship steam towards the island of Kia, where he hoped he could literally just beach the Britannic on the island of Kia's coastline, and this way he could prevent the Britannic from sinking. He was hoping that the rate at which the Britannic was flooding would be slow enough that he would be able to get the ship to the island of Kia before the Britannic sank too deep into the water and would be unable to continue under her own steam. However, once he ordered the Britannic to turn to starboard, 
Captain Bartlett and his crew noticed another big problem with the ship that was a result of the mine detonation. He noticed that the Britannic steering gear had been knocked out by the explosion, so at this point the Britannic was unable to turn. The rudder on the Britannic was basically locked in the straight position, which meant that the Britannic could only proceed forward, which unfortunately would not get the Britannic any closer to the island of Kia. However, once Captain Bartlett realized that the steering gear on the Britannic wasn't functioning, he immediately began to formulate a plan in order to help deal with this issue. You see, the Britannic, just like all other ships in the Olympic class, had three massive propellers located at the back of the ship. So, what Captain Bartlett ordered was, he ordered the ship's starboard side propeller to be turned off, but he kept the port side and the center propeller on. So, as the ship proceeded ahead, the force of these two propellers would push the Britannic to starboard. That way, he could slowly but surely turn the Britannic toward the island of Kia. So, with a good plan in mind, and with the support of his crew, roughly 10 minutes or so after the Britannic struck the mine, Captain Bartlett gave the order to have the Britannic proceed forward under her own steam once again. And once he turned the engines back on, the Britannic slowly but surely began to move forward. And believe it or not, because Captain Bartlett only had the port side and center propeller turned on, the ship, slowly but surely, began to turn to starboard and head towards the island of Kia. So at least in the beginning part of the sinking, it looked like Captain Bartlett's plan really had a shot at working out, and it looked like the Britannic may, just may, make it to the island of Kia. Now, right around the same time Captain Bartlett ordered the Britannic's engines to start again, this was also the general time frame at which the very first lifeboat to leave the Britannic left the ship. However, remember what I said earlier where Captain Bartlett ordered the lifeboats to be readied but not launched yet? Well, he didn't want any lifeboats to be lowered away while he was attempting to maneuver the Britannic and beach the vessel for safety concerns. However, the first lifeboat to leave the Britannic, well, it was lowered away by a group of panicked firemen who came up from below deck, rushed to the lifeboat, started up the system to launch the lifeboat, and then they basically jumped into the boat while it was lowering away. This lifeboat was located at the very back of the Britannic, right around here on the ship's port side stern section. And then, as this lifeboat was getting lowered away, the Britannic's engines were running because Captain Bartlett was trying to beach the Britannic. So, this lifeboat very nearly had a disaster because based on where this lifeboat was, as it was going down the side of the Britannic, it hit the water right beside the Britannic's port side spinning propeller. And also at this time, remember the Britannic was sinking very fast. So the very top of this propeller was already sticking out above the water. So try to imagine what this must be like for the people in that lifeboat. As soon as they touched the water, all they had to do is look over the side and they would see the Britannic's massive spinning propeller just literally feet from them. However, they got very lucky and they were able to detach the lifeboat from the Britannic and the Britannic did steam away as soon as this lifeboat was freed. So the men in this boat very nearly just avoided getting sliced to bits by the Britannic's spinning propeller. Over the next 10 minutes or so, Captain Bartlett remained fully focused on getting the Britannic to the island of Kia as quickly as possible. Now over this time, he noticed that he was having an increasingly and increasingly difficult time in controlling the Britannic. This was number one in part due to the fact that the ship's helm wasn't responding. And number two, he was also having great difficulty because the Britannic was listing further and further to starboard. Remember, the Britannic struck the mine on the starboard side, so that was the area at which the water was coming in, so it does make sense that the Britannic would list in that direction. However, around five minutes after he started up the engines, the E-deck porthole windows went underwater, thus allowing more water to flow into the Britannic on the starboard side and increasing the ship's list to starboard. Now, while all of this was going on, the Britannic's officers were working on the deck to get all the lifeboats ready for launch. However, a few crew members who were on the Britannic's port side, who also were working on the ship's lifeboats, were getting more and more concerned about the Britannic's ever-increasing list to starboard. So, they decided to do what they weren't supposed to do, and that was to launch two of the Britannic's lifeboats without the captain's permission. Now there would be two lifeboats launched from the Britannic over the next couple of minutes that the captain had no knowledge of. He had no clue that these lifeboats were about to be launched. These lifeboats were located on the Britannic on the ship's port side right around here, close to the midship section. Now these lifeboats had a fair number of people in them, so these lifeboats definitely should not have been launched under these circumstances. 
However, when these people got into these lifeboats, and these lifeboats were launched from the Britannic, the people who were in these boats had no clue of the horror that they were about to face. As soon as the first lifeboat to leave the Britannic made contact with the sea, and the ropes holding it to the Britannic were cut, and this lifeboat was no longer connected to the Britannic, the Britannic immediately began moving away from this lifeboat. Now this lifeboat, unfortunately, since it had no way to move with the Britannic, immediately began traveling aft along the Britannic's hull as the Britannic moved forward away from this lifeboat. Now, the current around the Britannic, due to the forward motion, was so strong that the lifeboat kept grinding against the Britannic's hull as it was traveling further and further aft. And the people in this lifeboat, who were trying desperately to get the lifeboat away from the Britannic's hull, found this to be a futile effort. So, they had no choice but to simply ride this lifeboat until it cleared the Britannic. Then, around a minute after this lifeboat was freed, those in this first lifeboat saw something terrible. They realized that a good chunk of the Britannic's portside propeller was now above the waterline, and their lifeboat was heading straight towards it. Many of the passengers jumped from the boat, swimming for their lives, trying to get clear of the Britannic's massive propeller, but it was too late. This lifeboat got sucked straight into the Britannic's massive propeller, shredding it to bits, killing several of the people in this lifeboat. There would have been very few, if any, crew members on the Britannic itself who would have witnessed this horrible event with this first lifeboat getting sucked into the Britannic's massive propeller. Mostly because, as far as most of the crew were concerned, all the Britannic's lifeboats were still on the ship. Not that many of them knew that any lifeboats had been launched at this point. Now, a few minutes after this lifeboat got sucked into the propeller, another lifeboat was prepared for launch. This lifeboat would launch once again from the Britannic's port side, but it would be launched from the Britannic's aptmost gantry davit. For those of you who don't remember, the gantry davits were those electric crane davits that we spoke of in an earlier episode. Now, this lifeboat was filled out with people, it was prepared to be launched, it was lifted over the Britannic side, and the crewmen operating the gantry davit began to lower this lifeboat away down the Britannic's port side. However, right before this lifeboat made contact with the water, when it was around 10 or 20 feet or so above the waterline, the crewmen operating the gantry davit stopped the lowering away process. So basically what this means is, there is now a lifeboat hovering right around here, 10 or 20 feet above the waterline, being carried with the Britannic as it sails along, basically only being connected to the Britannic by the ropes holding it to the gantry davit. Now the crew members in this lifeboat were furious with this crewman operating the gantry davit, and they began screaming at him, cussing at him, and threatening him, and telling him to finish lowering this lifeboat away. But the crewman operating the gantry davit stood his ground and said no. The captain has not given the all clear to launch this boat, so I am not going to put this boat in the water yet. The crewman continued to yell and curse for the next several minutes, and the crewman operating the gantry davit just ignored them. However, a few minutes later, a certain event would happen that would make all the crew members in this lifeboat thankful to the crewman who was operating the gantry davit for not launching this lifeboat. At the exact same time the men were screaming at the crewmen to finish lowering the lifeboat that was being held by the Britannic's gantry davit, another lifeboat was launched from the Britannic's port side right beside the spot where the first lifeboat was launched a few minutes earlier. This lifeboat, just like the first one launched, also got swept up in the current beside the Britannic's hull and began grinding against the hull of the Britannic. The people in this lifeboat tried desperately to push the lifeboat away from the Britannic's hull, but just like the first lifeboat, this proved to be a futile endeavor. As this lifeboat continued to travel further and further along the Britannic's hull, it would eventually pass directly underneath the lifeboat that was still being held to the Britannic by the gantry davit that we spoke of earlier. Now, just one minute before this lifeboat sailed under it, the crewmen that were still in the lifeboat held by the gantry davit were cursing at the man who refused to launch this boat. But by now, everybody in this lifeboat would have looked down over the side and saw this other lifeboat beginning to sail directly underneath the lifeboat still being held to the ship. Now, this second lifeboat that was just launched from the Britannic, it would share the exact same fate as the first lifeboat that was launched earlier, and it too would get sucked into the Britannic's massive propeller, killing a good number of people that were inside this lifeboat. So yeah, I think it's safe to say that the crewmen who were in the lifeboat being held up by the gantry davit weren't mad at the crewman who was on the Britannic anymore for refusing to launch their lifeboat. I think they were grateful to him at this point. But here's another thing to remember about these two lifeboats that got sucked into the Britannic's massive propeller. There were roughly 1,060 people on board the Britannic on the ship's final voyage, and of that number, only 30 would die in the sinking. 
Now, don't take what I'm saying out of context here. It is a tragedy that those 30 people died. But what I'm saying is, it's a miracle that the death toll wasn't worse. However, of those 30 deaths, most of them occurred when these two lifeboats got sucked into the Britannic's massive propeller. I'm sure not all of these deaths were caused by that. I'm sure some people on the Britannic were killed when the ship hit the mine. However, most of the deaths did involve these two lifeboats. And the thing is, these deaths shouldn't have happened. These deaths were caused by crewmen who were panicking, and they refused to listen to the orders of their captain, and they let emotions dictate their actions in a time of crisis. So this really does go to show that in an emergency situation, you can't panic. You can't let your emotions dictate what you do. You have to stay calm, keep a clear head, and listen to the orders of your superiors. Because if you panic and do something that you're not supposed to do, you could accidentally lead to the death of more people than what would otherwise happen if everybody just kept a cool head and did what they were told and evacuated the ship the correct way. Now, quite a few crewmen on the Britannic witnessed the second lifeboat get sucked into the Britannic's massive propeller, and they wasted no time in reporting this to the captain. Once the captain learned of the crisis unfolding on the Britannic's port side, he quickly ordered the Britannic's engines to stop. Now, believe it or not, once again, before the captain gave the all clear to launch any lifeboats, a third lifeboat was launched from the Britannic's port side, and this boat too headed straight for the Britannic's massive propeller. The Britannic's engines were stopped just before this lifeboat got sucked into the Britannic's propeller. The crewmen who were in this lifeboat said that all they had to do was reach out their hands and they could touch the Britannic's massive propeller blade, and they pushed off of the blades and got this lifeboat clear of the Britannic. Now, right around the same time Captain Bartlett became aware of the situation with the Britannic's lifeboats and the Britannic's propeller, he also became aware of another troubling thing. Reports were coming in that deep inside the Britannic, the flooding of the interior sections of the ship was only accelerating. By this point, the E-deck porthole windows had been underwater for roughly 10 minutes or so. So at this point, the water had proceeded past the ship's sixth watertight compartment and was beginning to flood the seventh. So around this time, Captain Bartlett would know that his ship is doomed. Now, just a quick time check for all of you. I want you all to have a good understanding of the timeline of this series of events because everything that happened on the Britannic happened rather quickly. The Britannic struck the mine at exactly 8.12 a.m., okay? Captain Bartlett re-engaged the ship's engines at roughly 8.20 a.m., and this was also the time that the very first lifeboat left the ship from the port side stern section that we talked about earlier. Now, the first lifeboat to get sucked into the Britannic's massive propeller occurred at 8.30 a.m., the second lifeboat to get sucked into the propeller occurred at 8.35 a.m., and then a few minutes after that is when Captain Barlett ordered the Britannic's engines to be shut down. So it's only been roughly 20, 25 minutes or so since the Britannic hit the mine, and look at how much stuff has happened on the ships in that short amount of time. Now you understand why I had to do a quick little backtrack, because a lot of stuff happened during the first few minutes that I really had to explain to you all in detail so you would have a clear understanding of all the events that occurred when the Britannic was sinking. Around 8.37 a.m., Captain Bartlett finally gave the all clear and ordered the crew to begin lowering away the Britannic's lifeboats. And boy, let me tell you, the Britannic's crew wasted no time in beginning to launch these boats. What you need to understand is, by this point, most of the Britannic's personnel would have already been located on the boat deck waiting for the order to evacuate, and the Britannic's crew would have already had the lifeboats primed and ready to be launched for quite some time now. So once Captain Bartley gave the all-clear and the lowering away process of these boats began, it wasn't more than a minute before the first lifeboat touched the water. The crew was launching these lifeboats away from the ship at a record rate. Sometimes three or more lifeboats all touched the water at the exact same minute. Now, the Britannic had roughly 48 lifeboats on board, and over the span of the next 15 minutes, the crew were able to get most of the people off of the Britannic, and they successfully launched 35 of the Britannic's lifeboats in that short amount of time. Around 8.50 a.m., Captain Bartlett was still on the Britannic's bridge observing the evacuation of his vessel. But he wasn't just observing the evacuation, he was also paying close attention to the rate at which the Britannic was going down. And what he thought he observed was, he thought he noticed that the rate at which the Britannic was sinking seemed to have slowed down a bit. So at this point in time, he decided that he wanted to try one last time to get the Britannic to Kia Island. So with most of the ship's personnel already off the vessel, he ordered a temporary pause on the evacuation so he could re-engage the Britannic's engines one last time in one final attempt to reach Kia Island. 
Now, even though he did order the evacuation to be paused, from what information I could find, it does seem like that a few lifeboats did leave the Britannic during this brief window of time that the ship's engines were re-engaged. However, it's important to note that even though some lifeboats were launched from the Britannic during this short period that the engines were re-engaged, the circumstances surrounding how these lifeboats were launched were different than earlier when those lifeboats got sucked into the Britannic's massive propeller. So what do I mean by this? Well, I'll explain. You see, during this time period, most, but not all of the lifeboats launched were launched from the Britannic starboard side. So all the lifeboats launched from this area Remember, the starboard side propeller was never engaged throughout the sinking, so any lifeboats launched from there would have had little to no risk of being damaged from the Britannic starboard side propeller. Honestly, the only way they could have been damaged by that is if they crashed into it somehow, so they're fine. But now, I did find some records that stated that a few lifeboats were launched from the Britannic's port side during this time period as well. And while I wouldn't do that, it was safer than it was earlier when those lifeboats got pulled into the propeller. You see, at this point in time, the Britannic had a very strong list to starboard, so it was impossible to launch any lifeboats from the Britannic's port side with the regular davits, because these lifeboats would literally grind up against the Britannic's hull, and anybody who was in these lifeboats would have a real risk of being thrown into the sea because these lifeboats could really capsize. The only way to launch a lifeboat from the Britannic's port side at this time period was to use the Britannic's gantry davits because these davits could lift the lifeboat out further away from the Britannic than what you could do with the regular davit. And you see, here's another thing. Because of the Britannic's sharp list to starboard, that meant that the Britannic's port side propeller was also higher up out of the water. And due to the angle at which the Britannic was currently at, any lifeboats launched from the Britannic's port side would have a much less of a risk of being pulled into the port side propeller. So, as I said earlier, it was still risky to launch a lifeboat from the port side during this time period, but it definitely wasn't as much of a risk as it was earlier in the sinking when those first two lifeboats got pulled into the Britannic's propeller. However, at this late stage in the sinking, the forward motion of the Britannic only helped to push the Britannic's bow deeper underwater. It wasn't long before the Britannic's bow and a good chunk of the Britannic's forward well deck were submerged. So, after roughly 10 minutes of Captain Bartlett trying desperately to get the Britannic to the island of Kia, at 9am he ordered the Britannic's engine stop for one final time and ordered everybody to leave the Britannic. He sounded two long blasts of the ship's whistle to let everybody on the ship know it was time to evacuate. This sound was also heard by the men in the engine room, so they knew as well it was time to get out of the Britannic before the ship went down. Captain Bartlett left the Britannic by simply walking out of the bridge and walked to the starboard side bridge wing and simply just stepped off the Britannic and walked into the sea and swam away from the ship as the final plunge was beginning. Right around this time, the Britannic's engineering crew emerged from deep within the ship, walked out onto the deck, and saw the Britannic's forwardmost funnel touching the water. At this point, they simply leapt into the sea and swam away from the Britannic. Once the engineering crew left the ship, there were no more living souls on board the Britannic during the vessel's final moments. As the Britannic's final plunge continued, the Britannic's stern began to rise higher and higher out of the water, eventually exposing all of the Britannic's massive propeller blades. This sight must have been eerily similar to that of the Titanic, which sunk a few years earlier. However, unlike the Titanic, since the Britannic had an initial list to starboard, its starboard list only increased as the final plunge continued. Eventually, the Britannic was laying completely on her side, with her stern sticking up out of the water. Then, as the Britannic began to slowly dip beneath the surface, survivors from the Britannic said they heard a tremendous roar or bang come from the front section of the ship that was already submerged. What this was was the Britannic's bow slamming into the seafloor. You see, where the Britannic was over 800 feet long, the ship only sunk in roughly 400 feet of water, so the Britannic's bow hit the seafloor before the stern was completely submerged. Once this occurred, it caused massive structural damage to the Britannic's hull, and you can see evidence of this in the wreck today. There's a massive hole in the Britannic's bow section. Then, at roughly 9.07 a.m., the Britannic's stern slowly dipped beneath the surface signaling the end to the third ship of the Olympic-class fleet. There were roughly 1,060 people on board the HMHS Britannic during the ship's final voyage, and as a result of the sinking, 30 people would lose their lives when the Britannic went down. 
Now, don't take what I'm saying out of context here. It is a tragedy that those 30 people lost their lives when the ship sank. However, it is somewhat of a miracle that the loss of life wasn't worse. It really is a testament to the quick actions of Captain Bartlett and his crew that they were able to save so many people when the Britannic went down. And we also can't forget that most of the lives lost on the Britannic were a result of some of the crew members panicking and launching some lifeboats without the captain's permission, and these lifeboats got sucked into the Britannic's massive propeller. Wait a second. I just realized something. Remember during the remember earlier in the video when I said that Captain Bartlett ordered the evacuation to be paused while he re-engaged the Britannic's engines to try to get the ship to Kia Island? Well, also remember that I said that some lifeboats were launched during that window of time? So does that mean that there were some crew members who ignored the captain's orders again and continued launching lifeboats? All right, I'm not going to dive into that. <laughs> okay, that's a whole other can of worms that I'm not going to explore in this video. Anyway, guys, I think this is a good place to wrap up the video here. So, hey, thank you all so much for watching. Be sure to leave a like. Be sure to subscribe. And thank you all so much for watching this video. You all are awesome. All right, everybody. Well, hey, you all stay safe out there, and I will see you in the next one. Have a good day, everybody, and thank you all so much for tuning in. Special thanks to our Captain Level Patreon supporters, Olivia Julius, Greg Gallick, and Callum Whaley. Thank you all so much for all the support.